afternoon. My name is Eugene Ben Como. I'm a Civil War reenactor or living historian as some people like to be called. And this is my 35th year doing Civil War reenacting. And I love the history of the Civil War and I've studied all the aspects of the Civil War and I still don't know everything about the Civil War. And medicine is one of the, the creatures that came about because of the Civil War. In the beginning, as you know, that if anybody got sick in your town, hamlet, city, or whatever, you didn't go to a hospital or you didn't go to the doctor. The doctor came to you. Mm -hmm. And if you were sick enough to be quarantined, you were quarantined in your own home. You weren't stuck in a hospital room and said, okay, you know, nobody can go in for six or seven days, and they took care of you. Mm -hmm. You stayed at home. Everything was at home. <clears throat> Most towns and hamlets did not have a regular doctor, for one thing, before the war. 99% of the time you went to go see the vet. If you broke an arm, a leg, you got scratched real bad, he knew how to sew the wound up, he knew how to fix a broken leg, and he knew how to give you some oils to kick, cure your stomach, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there was no medicine. You could go to the local general store and say, hey, I need some aspirins, I need some uh, kaopectate, I need this, 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 and this, because you didn't have anything. And another thing was, you never traveled more than 10 to 15 miles away from your town. If you live here in Newman, probably the first you went to was Tuscola. And that took you a day. If you walked, it took you a day. <laughs> Even 15, 20 miles. And a horse, it's a good hour and a half, two hours just to get there by horse, if you're lucky. If the stream didn't rise, because half the time there's no bridges like there are today, no paved roads like there are today. So when the war began, first of all, you had to enlist. You had to be 18 years of age or older. Well, we know that didn't happen. But the youngest for the Union Army, on record, is seven years old. And the oldest was 82. And they all went to war. They were a lot healthier than we are today. Stronger. Average weight, 87 pounds. Average height, Five foot seven inches to five foot ten was the average height. Elementary school kids are now five foot seven <laughs> inches tall. <laughs> How tall are you? Five foot four. He's getting there. To get into the military, of course, you couldn't get in unless you were 18 years of age. But these young kids found a way to get in because they went to school two or three days a week, two or three hours a day because they had to do their chores first. But he went over to the recruiter and he listened. And he was educated. He knew the three R's. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Because back then, everything was spelled the way it sounded, not the way it was written. So reading is R-I. <laughs> writing, R-I. Arithmetic. How do you spell arithmetic? R. <laughs> Uh, three R's. So he listened to the recruiter, and the recruiter asked the same question over and over and over again. So he said, aha, I can get into the military. Because my cousin's gone, my brother's gone, my uncle went. I want to go in the military, because they give you big money, a lot of money. Woo, more money than I'm making farming. Dad don't pay me nothing, all he gives me is food. And a roof over my head, and then he beats me. The military is going to be a lot of fun. So he listened, he listened, so he went home, and he got a piece of paper. And wrote that on there. You know what that is, don't you? The age. Mm -hmm. Number 18. Mm -hmm. And you put it back inside your shoe. And you put the shoe back on. Oh. <laughs> and the recruiter looked you in the eye, and remember back then everybody believed in the good book. Mm -hmm. So you cuss, swear, drink, chase women, carouse, stay up all night, and lie to your parents or anybody else. You never lied. Mm -hmm. So the recruiter looked you in the eye and said, son, are you over 18? Mm -hmm. And without lying, you said, no. Yes, because yeah, yes. you're standing on that piece of paper. <laughs> you are over 18. Over 18. <laughs> Physically over it. <laughs> your foot is on top of that paper. My hand is now over 18. Mm -hmm. 
and that's where they got the age. So the next thing you had to do, once you signed a paper saying that you were going to be a loyal American and join the Union Army, you had to get your physical from a surgeon. Big physical. First of all, I told you to raise your right hand. You had to have three fingers. These three. These two were great. If you had them, if not, that was fine too, but you had to have these three. And they told you to open your mouth, and you had to have two teeth on top, two teeth on the bottom. The rest were freebies. You didn't have to have them, but you had to have two on top and two on the bottom, and you had to be of hollow chest. Now, what is hollow chest? He made you make a fist, and if your chest sounded hollow, you were now in the military. And that's how women got in. Now, to tell you the truth, women were a little bit... And they looked more like men than they did women. So they got in the same way that the regular soldier would because he, they just enlisted. They didn't check, okay, strip down, let me see what you are. Cough to the left, cough to the right, none of this. That was it. Three fingers, why? You had to need three fingers to operate a musket. Pull the trigger and the hammer. And the other one was for balance. <clears throat> two teeth on top, two teeth on the bottom. All cartridges that were made for the rifle <laughs> were packaged in paper. The powder was on top and the bullet was on the bottom. And the only way you could expose this was to tear it. Mm -hmm. Pour it in the musket, ram it down, you're ready to go. That's why you had to have two teeth. Now, some guys would actually have a tooth pull. So they don't have one on top and two on the bottom. They say, ha, I'm going to get out of the infantry. Well, they put you in artillery, mm -hmm. cavalry, wagon masters, blacksmiths, whatever they thought you could do, they put you into it. The doctors would, actually. So as the war progressed, you're from the country. Douglas County, Vermilion County, Champaign County, and a lot of the other counties had to go to Springfield, Camp Butler. This is where medicine started becoming a way of life. You went there and you formed a regiment, 1,000 men. And each 1,000 men of regiments usually came from the same area. If you were from Tuscola, our Cole and Tuscola would get together, form 1,000 men, go to Camp <coughs> Butler and form a company or a regiment. They, all, they elected their own officers, their own sergeants, and everything else. But they were all <coughs> in Danville, the 73rd of Illinois, called the Persimmon Regiment or the Preacher Regiment. They were all preachers. They were made the officers because they could read <coughs> and write, and all the congregation became the soldiers. And when they went to Springfield, they didn't have enough men to form a complete regiment, so they took the other preachers and followers and made a complete regiment, nothing but congregation. And they said they were one of the cussingest, <laughs> doggonest troops they ever saw. They'd swear, cuss, drink, <coughs> smoke, whatever they wanted to, all through the war. And they're the ones, supposedly, that at Missionary Ridge, they said, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition, because they were going up the cliff. And they were running out of ammunition, so they had to <coughs> do this on the ladders to give the ammunition to the guy. So you go to... Camp Butler. Now the sicknesses begin. Start getting sick. You're meeting city folk. City folk have certain diseases they're immune to. Country folk have the animals and they have the way to distribute their enzymes and stuff to kill the bacteria that comes off of animals. But when you put the two together, the city folk give you the measles and you give them chicken pox. Mm -hmm. And don't come from chickens. Mm -hmm. But it was just a name they put there because of the little pot marks that it made. And it looked like chicken scratches. Because mm -hmm. you did this a lot in chicken pox. So they named it chicken pox. Measles, typhoid. And the biggest threat of all was stomach sickness. We now call it Montezuma's Revenge because of the water we drink, the food we eat. You're used to animal food. City folk are used to different types of food. They still eat the animal food, but it's been processed more. Country folk liked it right off the hoof. You kill the pig, you kill the cow, you're going to eat it. 
country folks would process the food, send it to the city, and then the city would process it even more before they got to the tables of the people in the city. So different illnesses came about. Out of 1,000 men, if you could put 500 to 700 men on the field when you left Camp Butler, you were doing good. If you look at the records, it shows that more people got sick the first six weeks of their military career than anything else. Number one cause of sickness on the field. Once you left Camp Butler and you were shipped, you had two weeks basic training. That was it. You fired your musket one time because they didn't have the ammunition to shoot thousands of rounds just to practice. One round to show you how to load the musket properly and you were sent on your way. You might go to Arkansas, Missouri, go to Kentucky, start there, or you might even go out east. Now, you're there. First thing they're going to issue you, of course, is your canteen. Number one cause of illness is the canteen. This is the first of many things that cause sickness. Why? Because these are made out of tin and they're soldered with lead. And when you add water to tin and you don't dry it every day, it's going to rust. And you're drinking the water, put more water in it out of the creek or wherever you're getting the water from, well or whatever, and you keep drinking with water still in here. So the water level goes down and the rust forms. Then you add water to it again. Then it goes down again, then up again, and down again. First thing to get you sick, the lead starts to disintegrate, causing leaded water. <coughs> the acid off the lead is starting to get into the water. So now you're going to get dysentery or stomach problems. And the problem was they thought creosote and turpentine was a way to cure a stomach ache because they mixed it together and boiled it and then gave it to you. Mm -hmm. Now they still have a version of that today. Now they tried different ways and they called it mineral oil. We still use this today. Kind of froze, but it's mixed with water, mineral oil, and wintergreen to make it taste better, supposedly. <laughs> it's still mineral oil. And today we call it castor oil. Mm -hmm. But your grandmother ran you around trying to give you a spoonful of that stuff because you were ill. Mm -hmm. But castor oil was something that they thought would cure you. It didn't. It just made it worse. Mm -hmm. Another thing that made you sick is what you wore. Your uniform. Why? You wore the same uniform all year round. Summer, winter, fall, and spring. One uniform. That's all you had. Maybe two or three pairs of socks, but you only had one uniform. And you, every time you cooked, did this. Germs didn't start forming in your uniforms. That's why soldiers, when they got shot, sometimes it wasn't from the lead ball that got the poisoning. It's because it took a piece of the cloth and stuck it in the wound, and the germs from the cloth actually started following in your veins, in your blood system, and getting you sick. When you got wounded, the most popular bullet that was used during the Civil War was the least expensive, the Manet ball. Of course, us English people, we like to use everything the way it's spelled. So it became the mini ball. French officer designed this, and it's a hollow bottom mixed with fat in the back, which is grease. Why is there grease in the back and it's kind of hollow? It's because when the muskets came out, first of all, they were smooth bores. There was no rifling in the barrels, so they had to use what they call a bucking ball, which was one large round bullet with three smaller bullets on the bottom. And this would cause the larger ball to actually go straight because if you just shot the round ball out of the musket, <coughs> you could go like this and go like this, go like this and just kind of drop down 
or it'd go up like this because it had no control. It just rolled. So they decided to put three smaller rounds on the bottom to kind of give it a spin to it. So it goes straighter. Killing range for one round ball with three little ones in the back was 50 to 75 yards. Not even a football field. So we were still using Napoleonic tactics, shoulder to shoulder, rank by rank by rank. And we went up against smooth bores, which was a 75 yard killing range at the most. But the problem was, is any musket you had, you could not shoot straight and hit a person at a farther distance. You actually had to move it up and kind of angle it until it came down and hit you. The mini ball came about. It gave you a little bit better spin because it had rifling. So this would heat up in the back, expand, go into the rifling and start making this spin. So here you got from 75 yards to 500 yards killing range. And if you're really, really good, you could hit them at a thousand yards with the right windage, the right spin, and the right circumstances. But you still had to aim the musket up. So if you're shooting a guy at a thousand yards and you have a company of soldiers here, they were safe. Because the brown was actually going up and over and hitting the guy in the back. Same way with cannonballs. Cannonballs, you still had to aim them up because they had no rifling. 90% of all cannons didn't have any rifling at the beginning of the war. So they just arched over and came down. So the guys here were safe. The guys here and the guys here had a little problem with the cannonball. But other than that, you were still safe in the middle. You want to sit down? Yeah. So this one became very accurate, and they were starting to put in all the different rifles and pistols were even using the conical round. A little bit smaller in front, heavier on back. Even the pistols went to the conical. We still use the conical rounds today because they're more accurate. Now, see the different size bullets that you have. Six to nine caliber. 58 caliber. This is the Spencer rifle cartridge and bullet. Then you go to your 45s, 40s, 36, 30s. These here are backpack hooks and two uniform buttons that came off the of battlefields. These are all battlefield found. But I want to show you the different types of bullets that was used. Thousands of different types of bullets. That's why some rounds would not fit other rifles. We got our rifles from anywhere from Belgium to Germany to France to England. Anywhere we could buy muskets, we bought muskets. That's why there's so many different types. We even tried to invent better killing machines, swords, knives, bayonets, anything and everything that could be used to kill a person we tried to invent. Well, it did, you know, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Soldiers did not believe in using the bayonet too much because it got too close to the enemy and they could kill them. So they preferred to shoot and run. The bayonet was used maybe half a dozen times to thousands and thousands of shoot shots. The problem was the soldier could fire three times in one minute. And these bullets are not traveling that fast. These bullets could be heard. At Shiloh, they said it sounded like a bunch of hornets. Because you could hear the <laughs> through their ears because they were making little sounds. And that was called a hornet's nest. But if one of these hits you, to the early doctors, it was from here to here with a dead shot. If you got hit in the gut, they left you for dead. Whether you died that day, next week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. They didn't try to do anything because they didn't know how to repair intestines, livers, or anything else. Arm and the legs, if it didn't hit a bone, they could go in there, pull the bullet out. Half the time, they could fix you up. The saying was, if you survive, you had a 50-50% chance of surviving a battle without getting wounded. If you got wounded, you had a 50-50% chance of surviving the wound. 
If they had to fix the wound, you had a 50-50% chance of surviving the hospital. So you were down to about 25%. Mm -hmm. Doctors had no idea how to repair bones. So a mini ball is not traveling at the speed of sound. Like some of them, they say, go today. You know, we can shoot a mile away and kill a person now with a bullet. This one here, if it hit soft skin, go through and stop. The problem was if it hit a bone, say this is your leg bone, and it hit here, it would follow the bone either up or down and just shatter the bone. Doctors did not know how to put pieces of bone back together again and repair it. So if it was more than, they said six inches, they actually had to amputate the arm or leg off. And they did it with very good precision. They say that by the time you got to the table, and the time the doctor decided to amputate your leg, he could amputate your leg in eight and a half minutes. But the problem was, here we go again. First of all, there was painkillers back then. There was ether, chloroform, and laudanum. Laudanum is a derivative of opium. That's where we learned how to get a painkiller with through opium. Boiling the, the pod and making a syrup. If you took a teaspoon of this in its natural state, once it's been boiled, you would die within five minutes of overdose. So they would take two tablespoons, mix it with one quart of whiskey or alcohol, because all the soldiers loved alcohol for some reason. And it was easy to kill the taste. So they mix it with, but they only gave you two teaspoons at a time for pain. Ether and chloroform had just come into being used during the Civil War. Ether, they thought you put a cotton swab on the face and you kept pouring it till the guy went to sleep. Well, the problem with ether is it will shut down your whole system. Just, and you died from that. So they find out actually that you poured a little bit of ether on there and just hold it. And they would breathe in the fumes more than the liquid. And when, as soon as he went to sleep, you pulled it off and they could amputate. But the problem was the government was kind of cheap. So they only send you enough for 100 men. A surgeon in the beginning of the war there was no medical service in 1861 and 1862 <coughs> where there was a bunch of surgeons working at one field. It was one doctor working on one regiment, his regiment. And the regiment might be 50% casualties, 5% casualties, 1% casualties. So he was up until he took care of all those soldiers. Never washed his hands, never washed his equipment, and usually it was a door. They took off the hinges of a house and laid it on flat so they could put the body on there, amputate, throw a little bucket of water so it won't be so sticky and bring the next guy and plop him on there. But he never washed his instruments until the end of the, until he was completely done. Back then they believed that if you can't see it's not going to hurt you. 75% of everything that we get is microscopic. We can't see it. But it's there, colds, sicknesses, pneumonia, and these poor guys were getting everything. Gangrene. Because of gangrene, we found out that lice, not lice, but uh, maggots. maggots, only ate the dead flesh. They would not eat living flesh. So they actually left it on there to eat up the gangrene skin. And they actually carried little jars of them. And they carried leeches in case you got great big boils and stuff. They put the leeches on the boils to suck that poisonous blood out. They were using whatever they could. They even used what they call liniments. This is Fraser's compound that was sold. It was for animals. Rabbits, horses, mules, dogs, poultry. Whatever they get their hands on. This is what they gave you. They had compounds they could mix. But like I said, they used creosote. They used turpentine. 
they use nasty stuff because that's they were just experimenting because they had never had this volume of wounds because before the war started we had maybe two hospitals in the state of Illinois where it's actually made for medical purposes one Chicago one St. Louis if we had any type of hospitals closer it was a like a mental hospital or a clinic of some type for some type of malady but it was not made for sicknesses when the war broke out we finally started the first ambulance service the first ambulance corps where they wore ribbons of red and wore uh, and used a red flag to let you know they were ambulance corps we did not have the cross the red cross that's no such thing during the civil war that came about because of the american red cross we had the letter h on the flags on a yellow flag that means hospital or hospital corps the red flag actually meant medical but we had no EMTs or anything like we have today where they'll come and take care of you what they they're called a triage medical team the civil war started a triage medical team which means they went out into the battlefield and actually said okay this guy goes to the hospital this guy he's dead put him over here this guy just then went and marked him and that's when they started the triage and they sent back to the hospital which is a mile a mile mile and a half from the battlefield to see the doctors that I could actually take the bullets out. If you saw a doctor and he was going to pull your bullet out, he had all the tools he needed. Bullet remover. Great, if you had this. Triage soldier. They, sometimes all this stuff got captured by the Confederates or the Union, whichever was carrying the stuff, because they attacked the wagon trains. And all the doctor stuff is usually on a wagon train. If they lost everything, they carried three items that they could use. A sewing kit, a probe, and a surgical tool. The probe. Put their finger in there, see where the bullet was. Oh, there it is. Okay. Surgical tool. Our favorite. Shaving knife. Because it was sharp. He would cut the hole open so he could reach in there and pull the bullet out because he didn't have the bullet remover. And then if he complained enough, he would reach over to the lucifer holder, the lucifer holder, pull out the little box and reach out and, and get a lucifer. <coughs> you now call it a match. Back then, during the Civil War, it's called Lucifer because that's what the guy named it when he invented it because he was a Presbyterian minister. And he was trying to go through the patent office and they told him to mention it, so he went to the Bible and found the hottest place on earth was down here. And who was the boss of the hot place? Lucifer. So they named him Lucifer. He would take one of the cartridges out of the guy's cartridge box, tear it open, and pour powder into the hole. Then he would reach in, light a lucifer, light the black powder, the black powder would ignite, make a fire, and would cauterize the wound and send him on his way. He used bandages. He didn't care where he got them from. Dead soldiers. He used them over and over and over again. He didn't use clean, <clears throat> sterile bandages. The first time he did, but then on he grabbed whatever he could get a hold of and use them over and over and over again. They never washed them. They never sanitized them or anything else. They just used them. As long as they weren't brittle and you can't bend them anymore because the blood had hardened so badly on the bandages, they still used bandages. He was also the dentist and the barber. And if he needed to, he'd write letters home too if he wasn't busy. The biggest sickness of all, of course, was your food. Hard tack, army bread. This is nothing more than water, flour, and a little bit of grease. Hard tack. Used it all the way up to Vietnam. 
I actually got some of these in the can one time. They were round, but half an inch thick. Looked exactly like this. And they sounded just like this. <laughs> they give you dried meat. Not jerky, but dried meat where they put the butchered uh, animal in the wintertime, hung it up on the side of the barn, let the blood, dra blood drain out, and then they put some uh, brine on it, and let the weather dry it. And then they cut it off and you start eating it. The poor Confederates, of course, they had to go over pee. Mm -hmm. Of course, it didn't look like this. It's the only thing I can get because we're not down south where I can get some green ones. But they actually looked like peas. Big pods of green. And if you eat them green, unless you roast them, they're not very good. So there you are, your meal. You had <coughs> three of these a day for two meals a day, plus salt pork. Salt pork is nothing than pig lard dipped in salt, because salt was a preservative, and that's all you had to eat. If you had a car and an arm or leg off, the type of saw you would use, you notice how nice and clean it is. That's what they look like. The blood would still be on there, and he just cut the next one, and the next one, and the next one. We had a form of stethoscopes. This does not look like this during the Civil War. I put this on here because I got tired of people asking me, what is this, every time they saw it. So I put a modern pair of earplugs. But actually, they went to here, and they had another little cone shape flat so you could put it on your ear and then you would put it on the for listening you say well why I said you know from the uh, pre revolutionary war no one could put their head on the chest of a lady that wasn't married to her to you even doctors could not put their ear to listen to the heartbeat on a young lady unless they were married so modesty was number one so you put pieces of wood and they drilled them and made a little round concave area with a hole in it. And he would put it on the heart and listen. And it was made out of wood. And then they went to this, and it was a cat gut, actually. The, the two <coughs> these. Cat gut. The scalpels that you see here were done by doctors in the hospitals. These were not used for field use. Uh, they have a nice little display out here. It has several of this type, but they were fold up like a pocket knife. They would fold up, and they're made out of tortoise shell. Beautiful. Made out of tortoise shell. These are what they call mahogany wood. They're just coated rubber. Wood, and then they dip them in rubber, and that was it. Or gouda percha. And this in here was to, so it wouldn't cut anything. They were reaching on, and they lift it up, cut it. They had little hooks they could use to uh, grab. And they also had a little thing, which is kind of neat. This is a guide. You put your scalpel in here, and you could follow the line by just holding the scalpel there and just pulling this. And it would guide you to make sure you went into a straight line. And that's in case you wanted to bleed. You stuck this end in and bled the soldier. That it was two purpose, one to guide your scalpel, one to bleed. So you had a bleeder as well as a guide. Now there's a lot of things that you could, you could see here. Uh, the first time that they started ambulance corps, they actually practiced, learned how to use ambulances. They had hospitals, that's what a hospital looked like. Just an open <laughs> tree, right in the middle of a tree. If you were lucky enough, they actually started the first ships were used for hospitals. Put as close to the water as they could. You had a ship, and they actually put the wounded on the ships and shipped them out. The hospitals started gaining popularity, and they started building them everywhere. From Washington, D.C., St. Louis, started bringing big buildings. And the nursing course started, the ladies. The military refused to admit ladies into the military. So an organization, the Christian Commission, started the Sanitary Commissions. And these were to recruit ladies over 30 of plain virtue to become nurses, to go into these hospitals 
And because of that, they actually saved lives, a lot of the soldiers' lives. Because before then, if you were hospitalized in a military hospital, the windows were closed, your bandages were never changed, and they hardly ever paid attention to you. They never washed you, fed you, bathed you, except once a day. They fed you once a day. So when the women came in, they opened the windows, they washed the sheets, they washed the bandages in boiling water. They came in and washed the patients as much as they could, and they fed them twice a day. And because of that, instead of losing five to 600 soldiers at a hospital, we were only losing between 50 and 100. And it started going down more and more because we were getting better medicines made. We started learning what our mistakes were in the first two years of the war. And they actually started building enough hospitals to come and compensate for all these soldiers that were coming in. Now the VA Medical Center in Danville, I don't know if anybody goes to the VA or not, that used to be the old soldiers and sailors home for Civil War soldiers. And that's where all the soldiers went to because of the illnesses. Now the number one sickness or, or injury to an artilleryman was his ears. Most of the ears were blown, the eardrums. They couldn't hear. And a lot of times they thought they were hooked to laudanum and stuff because they, they couldn't walk straight sometimes or they had dizzy spells and stuff. And it was not because that they were drinking too much medicine, it's because of the eardrums were <coughs> and the equilibrium was lost. And Mrs. Lincoln got hooked on laudanum. Instead of two teaspoons every four hours, she'd taken a bottle every half hour. And that's why she was put in a sanitarium in Chicago. You know, that was good stuff, but it was very, and, and the Danville VA was also a laudanum rehabilitation. They had to break you from the being hooked on laudanum. But there's so much that you can learn about the Civil War. Uh, the surgeons, this is the bag they carried. This is their hospital that they carried. They carried it on the shoulder, just like a backpack, only it was carried on the side. All their medicines, their equipment, and everything, they started carrying with them. And that was it. That was the whole thing they carried. If they had an assistant, he wore this. It's called a steward's badge. This signified the medical profession. And he was allowed to come and help you. Now this emblem was only used by the top guy in the stewardship. This meant he was a sergeant major in the military because he could read, write, he could write prescriptions, he could read, he could mix items, he was the only one allowed to mix the compounds and everything for the doctors. And he could actually write prescriptions during the Civil War for soldiers that needed medicine and stuff. But other than that, we had the first folding cup, medical cup, made out of tin. Still use them today. Boy Scouts use them extensively as the folding cup. Medical degrees. Right here. It was used, okay, we're going to give you this much, this much, or this much. It's a cup. And it came in a little container. So you see, the, uh, they even made their own scalpels. Took a piece of metal, sharpened it, put it on a piece of wood, and that's the scalpel. So they could work on it. <coughs> a rib spreader. And of course they were the dentists, so they could pull teeth. If you were a civilian, it cost you two bits. Pull a tooth. You know, if the tooth was kind of uh, hard to pull out, stuck that in there and popped it. <laughs> and of course, no medicine, no painkillers. Now the painkillers would run out, so they put a piece of stick, leather, whatever, because they wanted you to keep from biting your tongue off. Now a lot of people say, well, Civil War soldier had to do this. You know, maybe it was used some, but they didn't use it very often. On the field, maybe they would have used a bullet because it's soft lead. And you bite into it, and it would keep the teeth from going on biting your tongue. Basically, that's all it was for. And we hoped that you fainted when you were cutting your arm or leg off so you wouldn't endure the pain. And there's books on the Civil War. Uh, the soap they used is an original bar of lye soap. And you can tell it's lye soap because of the mirror. <laughs> Good for chiggers, mosquitoes, dry skin, 
and keeping away the ladies. You don't want any ladies messing with you, you get a little bit of a bar of lice soap, man. That'll, keep, that'll stay away from you. But, uh, you know, are there any questions? I got a couple. Sure. Um, so are you saying that our medical knowledge is greatly increased because of the Civil War? Well, because of the Civil War, our medical proudness or education system, so there was nothing but uphill. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of the tools you see here that came about during the Civil War mm -hmm. actually were used in the, in the 17th and 18th century, but they were just made out of brass or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and on ships and stuff like that. And then because of the Civil War, we realized we had to have a medical service. Mm -hmm. So the medical service in the military came about. Of course, the ambulance and services came about. Rail systems were used for medical transportation, the ships. Mm -hmm. Without the ships and the, and the railroad, we would have not been able to get the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And of course, our transportation system for soldiers mm -hmm. has greatly improved. Mm -hmm. You know, the, hos the, the, the hospital hel helicopters can be in there and out in nine minutes and get you back to a, a base hospital mm -hmm. or a front hospital, and then they can ship you to a base hospital to take care of you which none of that was available because in the beginning of the war, all you had was regimental surgeons, which meant they just took care of 1,000 men, mm -hmm. their men. If another regiment was with them, he didn't. Get out of here. You're not with this regiment. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't treat them. Wouldn't treat them because mm -hmm. he didn't have the time. He didn't have the resources. Yeah. So as our medical system became more and more and more, the instruments became better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the... Uh, Herbs, medical herbs, found out what they could be used. Mm -hmm. Moss could be used for wounds, you know, mm -hmm. to absorb some of the moisture and stuff like that, changing the bandages. Mm -hmm. Another thing was that they had horse hair for sutures because he ran out of the threat. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, what good is horse hair? I said, that has more disease and everything than anything else because of the horses. They said, well, the problem was horse hair was so... Brittle, I mean, so thick, it wouldn't bend. Mm. So they boiled it. Oh. So because boiling the hair, it killed the bacteria on the hair mm -hmm. and made it very soft, and they could sew you right up, and then when they came, clipped it off, no infection. Mm -hmm. But our biggest thing was disease, infections. We lost more men to disease, sickness, than we did to actual wounds. Is that right? Almost three to one. On, on both sides? Uh, oh, the com poor Confederate states, you know, they were hoping for the best from the English mm -hmm. if they could get those mm -hmm. blockade runners in. Mm -hmm. But they, they were in dire straits, mm -hmm. the poor Confederates were. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of stories about Andersonville. Mm -hmm. You know, and works was so bad to the, patient, to the prisoners and things like that, but you know, they had a doctor there, but he had no medicines to take care of the soldiers with. All the medicines they needed were going to the troops. Mm -hmm. They couldn't care less about the Union soldier in the prison. Mm -hmm. Camp Douglas. Nah, we ain't going to worry about them. You know, the, 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 half the soldiers at Camp Douglas had never seen snow, mm -hmm. ice, freezing weather mm -hmm. in the below zeros. And they were out there with one blanket or no blanket. And then just their uniform in that prison in Camp Douglas. Finally, the sanitation committee said, hey, we're going to take care of a few of these guys, too. So they started giving them blankets. Mm -hmm. And the townspeople of Andersonville actually threw potatoes and stuff out as the soldiers were getting off the train so they'd have something to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you, you know, you start reading the whole picture. It was just not the medical, but the whole military system of how to take care of wounded mm -hmm. that came about during the Civil War that we now use today. The syringe mm -hmm. came about. Mm -hmm. Back then the syringe was a great big boy with needles, but then when they, they were made out of gutta percha, which is the early plastic. So now look how many things are made out of plastic now in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. You know, in the old days you had to put them in sterilizer and sterilize all your medical equipment, pull them out, use them, and then sterilize them again. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't do that in the Civil War. Cold water. <laughs> Okay, next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My other question is, what kind of training would the surgeon... That have? was very... you got to realize there was only five hospital schools or medical schools in the United States. Everything else was overseas. 
England, France. That's where most of the medical practices were. And they were greatly advanced than... Philadelphia, there was one. Chicago, there was one. St. Louis was one. Atlanta was one. And a couple other places. But not big, big schools like we know of today. You know, you, you go to a nursing school, you go to a... You're going to be a surgeon, you can go to surgeon school, you're going to be an MD, you go to an MD school, you're going to be kid's school, you know, kid doctor, you go to a kid's doctor school. Back then, there was just five hospitals, or doctors with hospitals, in the big, big cities because they had plenty of patients mm -hmm. to practice on. Now, if you were worked for a doctor for two years, and you enlisted, and you talk, okay, I'm, I work with Dr. Fithian for two years, they looked at the, what? The guys worked for a doctor for two years. Let's put him in an assistant surgeon as a second lieutenant. They promoted your second lieutenant, gave you a surgical kit, and sent you on your way. Even though he wouldn't have a, any school? Even though you only hooked his horses up mm. and worked in the stables and cleaned his yard up. You worked for that doctor for two years, so you know something. Mm. And that was a big mistake because they didn't check any credentials. They didn't worry about... Oh, he worked for a doctor for two years. He must know something. Let's make him an assistant surgeon to help the surgeon. Mm -hmm. And the worst part was that kids, a lot of kids were musicians, drummers, fifers. They saw the worst of the wounds mm -hmm. and the wounded. Why? Because they were made stretcher bearers when the men went into battle. They weren't taken into the battle with them. So they said, okay, you musicians, go to the rear and become stretcher bearers. So they actually had to go out and pick up the dead and the dying, or the wounded, with our legs cut off, arms shot off, big gaping holes in their bodies, and pick them up and bring them back to the surgeon. I would rather be the guy being shot at and shooting back than I would having to pick up all these guys, 50, 100, 1,000 soldiers, and bring them back to the doctor. And being shot at and you can't shoot back. Some of the female <coughs> nurses that came about, uh, Dorothea Dix, Claire Barton, some of these actually went out into the battlefield while the battle was still going and started taking care of some of the, the wounded and the dying, comforting them. With lanterns at night, they would go out there and they call them battlefield angels because they would take care of Confederate as well as Union. And that was the problem, that they weren't taking care of no matter who it was. Anything else? That kind of... No, no, good. Very interesting stuff. Okay. Well, I want to thank you. A little speech here. You can come up and look at some of these items. If you have any more questions, be sure to ask. The second weekend in June, Saturday and Sunday, we'll be over at the Old State Capitol. We have an encampment all the way around the Old State Capitol called a medical encampment. And we have three to four surgeons show up and set up complete hospitals with all the equipment and the labs and everything that they use. We have an undertaker there. We have, uh, you know, a guy that went out and solicited to send your body home. Mm. And uh, you're more than welcome to come. We'll have some uh, military as well as civilian programs going on for the whole weekend. The one that runs the Civil War Museum, the medical museum there in Frederick, mm. he comes with a lot of items so you can look at. This is just a smidgen of the medical items that can be found for Civil War. I mean, I'd love to have everything medical from the Civil War. I never will. Mm -hmm. I might have a few reproduction items, but I don't have very many original items because they're coming harder and harder to find. And when you do find them, he's happy with what he had and don't want to really sell them. 